Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, we're going to finish Chapter 6 using this video. We're going to be focusing in on some of the more cybersecurity elements. When we left off in class the other day, we were talking about trespass issues. And there are two very uh, famous court cases involving these situations. The first one is in 1997. And this was CompuServe, which was an old ISP, kind of like America Online, versus a company called Cyber Promotions. Cyber Promotions essentially was a spammer. Um, and they were told by CompuServe that they could not use their servers, i.e. CompuServe's, CompuServe servers, to send out the spam. Cyber Promotions ignored it and claimed that they had free speech. <clears throat> so, of course, CompuServe sued. And a U.S. District Court ruled against Cyber Promotions, explaining that property rights could not be negated by freedom of speech. The judge also found that the amount of spam sent by Cyber Promotions was a clear burden on CompuServe's, CompuServe servers. The next court case was with America Online, and this was in 1998, and they were um, dealing with a company called LCGM Inc., and that was a pornographic website advertising company. And they would send a huge amount of spam to AOL's customers, and in doing so, they forged the AOL domain name in an effort to trick customers into opening the emails. Because as we all know, you know, only the um, least wise of us have figured out what's porn spam and what's not on our emails. The court once again held that a website operator's transmission of unsolicited bulk emails to customers of an ISP using the provider's computers and computer network constituted trespass to chattels. So again, that was restricted. We're going to move on to one of the bigger issues that we're dealing with today, which is international spying. And in this scenario that we're looking at, um, China has uh, readily been acknowledged to have spied on American companies and stolen design plans for jet fighters and aircraft carriers. Um, so what are we doing about it? Well, can we complain if we do it too? And this is exactly the issue. So we know that the Chinese are stealing our secrets, but we are stealing their secrets. We have hacked into and are spying on the Chinese as well as many other countries. And we know this recently, especially because of the documents that, was, that were released by Edward Snowden, the NSA contractor who was a former FBI agent. So we're not doing much about it, at least publicly, because if we make a big fuss about it, what's going to happen is China is going to make a big fuss about what we've been doing. So we're going to talk next about some security measures in cyberspace. And we're going to look at firewalls, antivirus software, filtering systems, encryption, SSL or secure socket layer, which is what we see with a lot of our banking transactions, Authentic authentication and digital signatures. So first, let's look at firewalls. And this is the first line of defense. And it should, i.e. most of the time, prevent intruders from gaining access to the internal network. Keep in mind that China has a massive firewall. And they actually call it the Great Firewall of China, and it doesn't clearly stop us from getting in there. But firewalls trap any external threat before it can penetrate the system. Simplest version is the packet filter, which uses the router to filter packets between the internet network and the external network. It examines the source address of each packet along with its destination address to determine whether it is trustworthy or not. If it is suspicious, it can refuse the packet's entry. There are specialized firewalls because of denial of service attacks. However, they are very expensive and tend to degrade performance. And 
again, if you are Amazon.com or if you're Target, you really don't want people saying this site is a mess and it takes too long to do anything. So the trade-off has been complicated for both sides, both the consumer and the company itself. Next we'll talk about antivirus software. Um, most of us should have some sort of antivirus software on our computers and on our cell phones. And what it does is it scans a computer system for malicious code and deletes that code once it is found. New viruses emerge every day, so antivirus software must be updated frequently. And the best antivirus software will in fact update automatically without you having to do anything. And just to kind of put this in perspective, about 300 new viruses hit the internet every month. That comes out to about 10 a day. So these antivirus software manufacturers are very busy looking for and trying to head off the next virus. Next we'll look at filtering systems. And these include software like Mimesweeper, which scans incoming mail for spam and for viruses while also scanning outgoing mail to ensure that corporate data is not leaving the company. Um, this is used mostly in corporations and companies and it's not um, it's not the kind of software that employee privacy contributes to or helps or supports. This is going to look at everything an employee does. Another big, huge, massive system is encryption. Encryption is using information to keep, I'm sorry, is used to keep information secure while it is being sent from one internet user to another open and open over an open network. Data is coded and only the authorized recipient can read it because they have the proper key that decodes the information. It has been used for centuries by cryptographers, and those are the folks who code, who make codes and break codes. If you look at the little uh, picture I have on the slide, you'll see that they use the terminology of key as the encryptor. So if you don't want anyone in your house, you don't give them a key. And this is the same concept. So the process runs this way. Data is encrypted. It is sent in the form called ciphertext. And then the recipient decrypts the data to read it using the key, the decoding pattern. The standard today for private encryption is a 128-bit algorithm, which is considered unbreakable. And this is where math majors become so vitally important they need algorithms that are mathematically true all the time. So they use these very complex mathematical equations to create these algorithms. Now there's also public key encryption. Public key encryption uses two different keys at once. A combination of a private key and a public key. The private key is shown only to your computer while the public key is given by your computer to any computer that wants to com communicate securely with it. To decode an encrypted message, a computer must use the public key provided by the originating computer and its own private key. So it needs two keys. It's kind of like a safety deposit box at a bank. So although a message sent from one computer to another won't be secure since the public key used for encryption is published and available to anyone with anyone who picks it up can't read it without the private key. So in that kind of a scenario what you're looking at is the way that we communicate with our credit card companies, our banking companies, we have a key and that's usually our password. And we'll talk about that in more detail when we get back to authentication and digital signatures. So then we have the secure socket layer and this is known in the industry as SSL. And it's used in most financial transactions online. You usually see a little 
uh, lock up at the top of your address bar and that tells you that you're in SSL mode. And this is a form of encryption that prevents credit card info and other personal information from being accessed. And it's essentially another layer of security to prevent hackers from getting in and city. Next we look at authentication. Authentication is also used to establish secure transactions on the internet. It involves the security system validating the identity of a user using credentials that have been validated previously. So in a sense, your password, whatever system you are logging into, whether it is your bank account, whether it is your credit card account, whether it's even your school account, they are asking you to authenticate who you are by using your password. Then we're going to look at digital signatures and this is a private key used to sign one signature to some message or piece of data and a public key used to verify a signature after it has been sent. And you'll see the visual that I have on there and essentially that key validate helps validate the signature. So how does the government feel about encryption? Well, it is sought to regulate encryption systems dealing with international communications on the internet by demanding a backdoor access. In other words, they want some measure of control over the public and private keys. Essentially, they want a copy of every key that is out there, whether it is a giant massive company like Microsoft or a small little company that is specializing in security measures. And the government claims it is to assist in law enforcement if a terrorist should gain access to these encryption systems. And like we discussed in class on Wednesday, a lot of these things started happening in the early 2000s, right after September 11th, 2001. We had, as a country, the United States, never been attacked on our soil so dramatically. And keep in mind that Pearl Harbor back in the 1940s was not the continuous USA. It was in Hawaii, so it didn't really touch a lot of people the same way that seeing New York City and Washington, D.C. burn did. So in 1993, this even starts way before 2001, in 1993, the NSA, the National Security Agency, developed an encryption system called the Clipper Chip. It was an encoded algorithm known as Skipjack, which gives law enforcement officials access to all encrypted systems. So this hasn't been something that's only been since 2001. It escalated in 2001. But we've always had a certain desire to find out what's going on throughout the history of data collection. The skipjack system had two different government agencies each hold half of a binary encryption code. With a court order, law enforcement can access both halves to spy on communications between suspects. So what they're trying to do is once they identify someone, they can then access both parts of this encryption so they can go ahead and do some serious spying. This was usually used for political issues or for criminal activity, especially with mobsters and different colluded groups like a gangs. We really weren't doing this on a huge um, system like we are today. The public, res uh, public response Civil Libertarians said it was an assault on our privacy rights. Um, you'll see my little cartoon here. You know, they're watching us. They know what we're doing and they want to pay attention to us. Private companies then got into the act. Uh, in 1996, President Clinton gave companies the option of using a private third party uh, company to hold the halves of the binary encryption. So you're not just using government agencies. <laughs> And keep in mind that in this country, there is a huge desire to push government out and to encourage private companies to take over their actions. 
Also in 1996, the government issued a third encryption plan called the Key Management Infrastructure, otherwise known as KMI. It authorized government infrastructure to have key recovery services. This required companies to have a plan in place that shows how the decryption key was stored and agreed that they would want to turn it over if presented with a warrant. So all of this is going well, and then in 2013, Edward Snowden pops up. He's an NSA contractor. He's a former CIA agent, and he reveals 200,000 documents on WikiLeaks that prove the government was essentially collecting millions of pieces of information from our phones and computers. Now, why did he go ahead and release this information? Well, according to his interviews, he basically said he did not believe that what the United States was doing was right. So he felt that he had to blow the whistle on illegal activity. These documents also showed that the USA was not only spying on their own allies, but tapping the phones of the leaders of other countries, including the President of Brazil, the Chancellor of Germany, and the former and current President of Mexico. And they are mad. They are really mad at us. In fact, uh, Dilma Rousseff, the President of Brazil, canceled a state trip into the United States um, which would have been very beneficial because Brazil just found a whole bunch of oil they need help pulling out of the ground um, because they were so angry at us. Now, the other thing, in 2013, so just uh, about two months ago in October, the director of the NSA, General Keith Alexander, admitted to a secret pilot program to monitor the precise locations of Americans through their cell phones saying the highly intrusive tracking data may be something that is a future requirement for the country. Now, what he's saying is that we may need to do this down the road. Except, this month it was reported that the NSA is reportedly collecting almost 5 billion cell phone records a day under a program that monitors and analyzes highly personal data about the precise whereabouts of individuals wherever they travel in the world. That's a lot of cell phone records and essentially what it seems like is that they are spying on all Americans. So they're under a huge attack right now and um, this is going to be a big issue as we approach 2014 and see how that comes out. Now how did the NSA respond? So they said the U.S. officials told the news media that efforts to collect and analyze location data are lawful and intended strictly to develop intelligence about foreign targets with information about the location of domestic cell phones only gathered incidentally. So what they're basically saying is that, yeah, we're collecting all this information and yeah, we're spying technically on American citizens, but we're not actually caring about what they're doing. We're just focused on what these foreign terrorists or potential terrorists are doing. So again, what we're looking at here is a situation of once they're able to harness the power of the internet to analyze all these records, what are they going to do next? 